Thank you, Joyce. Much appreciated. Welcome out, everybody. It's wonderful to be back home in West Texas. I grew up uh, in West Texas. I was born in Big Spring. I graduated from high school in Colorado City. Uh, my father is the mayor of Colorado City. That won't help you at all if you're speeding through Mitchell County. <laughs> Don't drop my name. They'll only double the rates on you. So it's wonderful to be back home. Uh, I moved to Waco in 86 when I graduated from high school, married uh, a gal from that area, and we've been in the Waco area pretty much the whole time. Uh, next month we'll celebrate 25 years of marriage. We've got three kids, a uh, high school freshman and two at Baylor. My wife is on faculty at Baylor, so I've got a freshman a botany student, Delaney, and then my oldest, Vanessa, is an anthropology major. Uh, she'll graduate uh, from Baylor uh, here shortly with a 4.0 every semester, I might add. So um, I'm not exactly sure who her father is, but uh, she got her brains from somewhere. Um, but you're not here to, to hear about my kids. You're here to hear about camels. I told Bob Blueheart uh, if he had selected a building to do this program that had taller doors, I would have been happy to bring a camel in. But these dinky little doors in the commissary just aren't going to work for our camels. Now, the truth is, we do travel. I know, Bob, you know, let's work on that for next time, okay? Um, and the truth is, we found out, I should say thanks to Joyce for having me speak, and even larger thanks to Evelyn for getting the technology up and running. I don't care what you've heard about a camel being difficult, recalcitrant, uh, obstinate, stubborn. A camel is a walk in the park compared to computers and technology. <laughs> it's the truth. Evelyn and I tried 94 different ways to hook up her projector, my computer, someone else's computer, my projector, their projector, Joe's tablet. And he said if he was bored, he was going to need that. Joe, I hope you don't need your tablet. Yeah, shut your Facebook down, all right? This is gonna be great. Shortly, we're gonna be juggling cats on fire. Joe, you don't wanna miss that, all right? So Evelyn, thank you for getting the technology. Um, just a major headache, I know it was, so thank you. I've brought a film that I wanna show you today. I am not a filmmaker. I am simply a camel rancher. Uh, I graduated from college with a, a music degree. Stay with me, it's all going to add up at some point, all right? So I find myself a camel keeper in a zoo in Nashville, Tennessee in the 90s, and I fall in love with camels. I'd taken care of all kinds of animals, from carnivores to birds, and you name it, in the zoo, kind of everybody wore lots of hats there at Nashville, but I found myself taking care of camels and fell in love with them. Probably six to eight months after I'd become a camel keeper, somebody gave me a book about the U.S. Army camel experiment. I'm living in Tennessee at the time, okay? And I'm reading this book, and this story is headquartered in Texas. Everything is Texas-centric. Though the story spreads out of Texas, at times, it's headquartered and based in Texas. And as a lifelong Texan on loan to Tennessee for a few years, I read that book with an appetite that I had never, ever read a book in my life before or since. And I read that book and I closed it and I thought perhaps the, the, the only original thought I've ever had in my life, and that was, I've got to get home to Texas and get my own camels so I can tell this story. So at a point I go to the zoo director, Rick Schwartz, and I, I kind of shuffle into his office, Rick, I'd like to buy Bill and Ted, these two young camels that I had trained. And he said, yeah. And he said, excellent. <laughs> My shoulders kind of dropped because I wasn't expecting to say yes. Now I'm thinking, how am I going to get two camels from Nashville, Tennessee back to Texas? So we worked it out. And here we are, not quite 20 years later, our family has eight camels. We just had a baby born uh, nine weeks ago this week. Uh, so the herd is growing. We've got another one I'll do an ultrasound on tomorrow at our vet. So cross your fingers, we might have another baby on the way. Over the years, we've had as many as a dozen camels on the farm. And we'll talk about, uh, perhaps after the film, if you have questions, you're intrigued at, at what it's like to be a camel rancher, I'm happy to answer those questions. But in short, it's a whole lot like having horses or cattle, except they're camels. It's very similar, the management of them. So we can talk about that. But that book that really set me on my path, it's called Noble Brutes. The author's last name is Boyd. I can't recommend it highly enough. It truly is the best of about a half dozen titles that have been written about this piece of history. All right. So just to kind of put it in context on a time frame, you're looking at the 1850s. We're after the gold rush. 
just a pinch, all right? And really, this is a response to the gold rush and Western migration. But we're before the Civil War, and that's key, all right? Now, it'd be interesting to ask, show of hands, before you saw the, the flyer and you knew that Doug Baum was coming to talk about the U.S. Army Camel Experiment, how many of you in here had actually heard about the U.S. Army Camel Experiment? Fantastic, great! A uh, good third of you or a quarter of you maybe had not, all right? But for those of you who have, very likely everything you've heard about it, unless you've studied, is wrong. <laughs> everything. The camels weren't abandoned because their feet couldn't handle the rocks of West Texas. Pure myth. It didn't happen. Um, camels don't store water in their humps. This is a great myth that persists even to today. Um, at the end of the Civil War, the army didn't simply open the corral and chew the camels out, and we now have a feral camel population running around the U.S. Southwest. <laughs> that, too, didn't happen. But these, these points, kind of uh, farcical as they may sound, this is what I have to answer to any time we have our camels in public at an event. It's really hard to get into the meat and potatoes of this bit of history because I've always got to wade through those myths, that lore, all of this stuff that simply isn't true. So, the film I'm going to show you, a little background on it. In 2009, the Texas Historical Commission asked us to provide camels for an event that would commemorate the Eccles Expedition. It was one of a handful of camel expeditions out into West Texas. 2009 would be the 150th anniversary of it, so we started out from Fort Lancaster State Historical Site near Sheffield, and we were gonna do a section of Eccles Trail between Fort Lancaster and Fort Stockton. Happened to be in 2009, Fort Stockton was also celebrating their sesquicentennial, so we're gonna roll a couple of events together. Basically, the route that Eccles took in 2009 was modern I-10. So the Texas Historical Commission basically contracts with our camels, and we round up a few other reenactors. We have an infantry group, a mounted infantry on, uh, on horseback. We have a wagon pulled, pulled by a pair of mules. We have a nice little movement out on the ground. And so we agree to do this event. A friend of mine comes, and he videos it. And we sit on that video for a good couple of years, Jimmy and I, the videographer, not knowing what to do with these hours of footage of camels simply walking down I-10. It's not real exciting footage, but we've got hours and hours of it. We shot it from above, from a lobe, from behind, from on top of a camel saddle, strapping a camel, uh, camera onto the saddle. We did everything we could to kind of glamorize this footage, but in the end I had hours and hours of camels simply walking through the frame. So summer of, it must have been 11, I believe, I, I started looking through this footage and I'm trying to figure out what can I do with this? Where can I go with this? Again, hours and hours of wagon wheels like this and camel's feet like this. So it occurs to me that there's never been an academic study of the U.S. Army camel experiment, certainly not in video form. So my gears start turning and I think, you know what, I'm gonna put this footage together and I'm gonna put it six, seven minutes long and I think that every frontier fort is gonna to wanna to show this in their visitor center. That's what I'm gonna do with it. So I sit down to edit this film. I've never done anything like that before, but I've got a good computer, and summertime's pretty slow for the guy in the camel business. So I sit down, I edit this footage, I write a script, I put it all together, and that's what you're gonna see here. All right, so now here we are, almost summer of 15. Four years later, maybe three years, it must have been summer of 12. I've got this video, we've put it on YouTube. This week we hit over 5,000 views. We can thank historical sites, uh, teachers in classrooms, um, uh, just folks who are interested in history for getting us up to 5,000. That's really exciting. Next month I'll be showing the same film that you're seeing in London at an international camel conference. Yes, there are international camel conferences. <laughs> In fact, there are two this year, in London, next month in May, and then in June, I'll be traveling to Kazakhstan. It's on the other side of Dallas <laughs> to yet another camel conference. So the story of the camel experiment headquartered here in Texas is really gaining some traction. Not so much through Hollywood, and we've got some Hollywood depictions of this story over the years, but they're absolutely horrible history, as Hollywood tends to do. It's great Hollywood, just not great history. So that's really the goal for me creating this film. So I want to share this with you. Hopefully Evelyn has got the, uh, the volume set for this, and it won't be blowing those of you who are right next to the speakers away. If I see your hair blowing, I'll bring it down. So 
here we go, enjoy, and then we can do some uh, questions and answers after the film. Following the gold rush, by the 1850s, pioneer families began crossing the arid interior of North America. But traditional livestock suffered in the hot, dry conditions. In the mid-19th century, American military officers, diplomats, and academics proposed the introduction of camels for use as pack animals in the U.S. desert southwest. In response, Jefferson Davis, then Secretary of War, introduced legislation appropriating $30,000 for the purchase of camels. With congressional approval, the USS Supply made two voyages to North Africa and the Middle East in 1856 and 1857, returning with camels purchased in Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, and Turkey, offloading them on the Texas Gulf Coast at the thriving port of Indianola. Once on American soil, the 75 camels were driven overland and headquartered in the Texas Hill Country at Camp Verde, near present-day Kerrville. Accompanying the camels were a handful of native camel drivers, among them Greeks, Turks, and Arabs, hired to tend the animals and teach the American soldiers the art of camel handling. Without hesitation, the camels were put to work hauling supplies between the Quartermaster Depot in San Antonio and their home of Camp Verde, a distance of over 50 miles. Camels became a regular sight on the Texas frontier, along with the more familiar horses, mules, donkeys, and oxen. But greater trials were needed. The Beale Expedition of 1857 departed from San Antonio with two dozen camels and orders to survey a wagon road from New Mexico to the Colorado River border of California. Along the way, and before leaving Texas, Beale stopped to resupply at Fort Ange, Fort Clark, Fort Lancaster, Fort Davis, and Fort Bliss. The section of road Beale cleared from Albuquerque to California would later be known as Historic Route 66. Beale was clearly impressed with the camels. The more I see of them, the more interested in them I become, and the more I am convinced of their usefulness. Their perfect docility and patience under difficulties renders them invaluable, and my only regret at present is that I have not double the number. Lieutenant Edward Beale, July 1857. In 1859 and 1860, the U.S. Army topographical engineers conducted two 90-day expeditions using camels to carry supplies into then-unknown West Texas, searching for more practical routes to the U.S.-Mexico border. Staging from the newly established Camp Stockton and exploring what is now Big Bend National Park, the Hearts and Eccles expeditions crossed a landscape so harsh and waterless they were eventually forced to abandon their mules. On July 2nd, 1860, Lieutenant William H. Eccles wrote in his journal, We camp dry without any prospects of finding water. We're all very uneasy, not to say a little frightened, for our welfare. Over the three-month journey, the camels had to survive multiple stretches of days without water, and though at one point the camels' feet had been abraded to the quick, to quote Eccles, the soldiers returned to Camp Stockton without the loss of a single camel. None other than Robert E. Lee, then in temporary command of the Department of Texas, remarked in a letter to Washington, the expedition was provided with a train of camels whose endurance, docility, and sagacity will not fail to attract the attention of the Secretary of War, and but for whose reliable services, the reconnaissance would have failed. Despite the praise from those of high rank, the inevitable division of the Union would turn the government's attention away from the camels. Texas aligned itself with the South, and the Confederacy took over Camp Verde along with all its assets. During the Civil War, Camel caravans transported southern-grown cotton between San Antonio and Brownsville, Texas, one of the South's only ports not blockaded by the Union. After the war, 
Jefferson Davis was highly unpopular and virtually any project he'd been associated with was dismantled. The camels were sold at auction. Freighting operations used Beale's camels in California, Nevada, and Arizona, and camels were put to work packing freight between Texas and Mexico. Camels even helped build the railroad out west. Ironically, it would be trains that would put an end to camel caravans crossing the American desert, but possibly no larger factor than the project's early supporter, Jefferson Davis, doomed the camels more. Perhaps a historical marker at Old Fort Stockton says it best. The camels were a practical success, but a political failure. And there you have the film. I let the crowd, oh, thank you. <clears throat> I let the credits run there because uh, truly, even though I'm the guy who sat there in my, my, uh, my small office there at my house to, to create what you see there, it couldn't have been done without all of those names in there, all right? Uh, I pulled in favors from everybody I know. The narrator is my brother. He makes a living. In fact, he worked here at, uh, at Kixie back in the, uh, the 80s. He's a, a radio a disc jockey. Now he makes his living doing uh, freelance voice. You've heard him on commercials for Southwest Airlines, Kroger Supermarkets. He's been on video games, and I get a sweet deal for my videos. So my brother, I pulled in there, and I knew I was going to need some character voices. The three that you heard in there, Robert E. Lee, an old friend of mine from college, um, Beale, one of the first voices on there, was actually my high school drama teacher. I emailed him, gave him the script, asked him if he could read it, he sent it, it was great. The, uh, the middle voice in there of Lieutenant William H. Eccles, who uh, helmed one of the expeditions out into the Big Bend area, is actually voiced by Cody Mobley, who is the, the site manager down at Fort McCabot. He's here. Cody, would you stand up? They're going to want to see the beautiful face that goes with that beautiful voice. Cody's still waiting on the check, I think, for that uh, performance. I think he said when we hit that 5,000 mark on YouTube, he's going to start wanting some residuals. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I pulled in favors from everyone I could imagine, put the thing together really on no budget whatsoever. And now we're uh, seeing this uh, being shown at Fort Lancaster, in fact, in their visitor's center. Uh, Fort Davis has a copy of it. El Moro National Monument out in far western New Mexico also showing it in their visitor's center. So I'm really, really proud of the turn that it has taken. And it's, uh, of course, in every classroom I can, I can uh, get with twice a year. I'll email uh, announcements out to the region service centers, the ESC, the, the Texas Education Service Centers, and they send it out to their uh, social studies teachers throughout their campuses, fourth and seventh graders who are studying Texas history. So I know we, we really get the views on YouTube up that way, so I'm really, really proud of it. Uh, short though it may be, six and a half, almost seven minutes, it can't quite delve into all of the politics of the day and all of the reasons uh, that, that the camels were needed and ultimately uh, the project was abandoned. So uh, in the time that we've got remaining here after the film is finished, uh, I'm happy to take questions. So if any of these uh, points in the film uh, seem contradictory to what you've heard before about the Army Camel Experiment or if new points were brought up or if you're just interested in our life with our, our family's farm with our camels, happy to take questions now. Joe, you're going to scare me to death, so let's, let's, let's let you go first, all right? That's exactly right. Yeah, Joe's, Joe's point is, were the camels ridden? And they weren't. Now, understood, Jefferson Davis, who is key to this whole thing, though it wasn't his idea, he got the money for it, all right? His uh, lack of popularity after the war also would spell the camel experiment's demise. But you can bet, when Davis went to the Senate lobbying for money for camels, he was laying it on thick. He said, imagine our troops mounted on camels, sitting fully three feet higher than on the back of a horse. Imagine how they could survey the landscape to look for hostile Indians. 
So this is how Davis is selling it. He may have had that in mind, and, and of course, had the Civil War not intervened, you may have seen camel-mounted regiments. I should back up. In 1856, when our first camels arrived here, purchased by the US government by congressional decree, we weren't the first army to come up with the idea of using camels for war. In fact, we find ourselves in 1856 the last army on the planet to ever employ a camel. You've heard of the Persians, right? They used them. Uh, every culture in the modern Middle East, uh, up to and including Rome at the time of Christ, used camels. So when the US Army decided to, to get on the camel bandwagon, we were the last ones to do it, all right? And I can't overemphasize Davis's role in the inception of the camels, but ultimately their demise. But you can bet he laid it on thick. Interesting story, again, something you can't really delve into in a six and a half minute film, but how, were the, how was the camel appropriation made? Davis went to Congress, all right? At this point, he's just a Mississippi senator. Now, he is a celebrated war hero from the Mexican-American War. He had some, some clout, some track record, but at this point, in the, in the early uh, 1850s, He's just a Mississippi senator. He goes to Congress in 53 and says, I think this camel idea is a good one. Would you fund it? And you can imagine the response in the halls of Congress. It was laughter. So he's laughed off the Senate floor in 53. In 54, he comes back and says, I think this camel idea is a good thing. We're trying to move folks west. The southwest is hot and dry. We need to be able to move goods. The camels are much stronger than a horse or a mule. They can go longer without food and water. Again, he's laying it on thick. 54, he's laughed off the Senate floor. 55, because Davis is doggedly tenacious, he comes back to the Senate, but he's got an ally in the form of Senator Shields, also a Mexican-American war hero. Shields would go on to some, uh, some uh, Civil War fame as well, but at this point, they're just senators. Shields in Illinois puts forth a roads and bridges bill for Illinois. Who's gonna say no to that? And at the bottom of that roads and bridges bill in fine print is $30,000 for camels. They put forth the bill. Roads and bridges are approved for Illinois, and that, folks, is how you can turn a camel into pork. <laughs> yes, sir, Bob. The regulation load for a mule was 350 pounds. And that's packing. Now, certainly, you could have a rider on that in gear, but regardless of what it's made up of, 350 was a regulation in the, in the military handbook 350 pound regulation load for a mule. The camels, because of all reasons of physiology, I'm happy to explain, were packing as a regulation load 350 at the minimum to 500 pounds, and that's on the smaller, lighter built female camels. The Army was using both, males and females. The larger males were carrying between 500 and 750, so fully double what the maximum load on a mule was, and that wasn't even their max. There were bigger, stronger males. There was one fantastic demonstration on the streets of Indianola just days after the camels were unloaded down on the Gulf Coast. Everybody is dubious. They're sitting around. You can imagine this old western town on the, on the Gulf of, uh, of Mexico, and the citizens are looking at these funny creatures. They've never seen anything like that, and they're shaking their heads, wondering what the government has spent their money on. Kind of like today, right? <laughs> so Major Wayne, who's in charge of the camels, parades one of the biggest camels out. It's actually a hybrid cross between the one hump camel and two hump camel. This is something that's done in parts of the world, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Hybridization, like a mule. They're bigger, stronger. So he brings out this camel named Tuwili. They picked him up in Turkey. And they had that camel kneel down and they put 1,200 pounds of hay on that camel. Now understand that camel's knelt down on the ground. So those good old boys in Indianola are looking at that and they're taking bets. You know, that camel's not only not gonna be able to walk with it, he won't be able to stand up. And Wayne has the, the handler have that camel rise up and walk down the street just like it's another day at the office. So maybe at that point folks' minds were starting to change a little bit. But the, the, the basic weights that they were carrying, 350 to 5 on the females, 500 to 750 on the males, and that's day in and day out. Regular work, not even, oh my gosh, we've got 1,200 pounds, so let's carry it. You certainly could do that, but those regular weights were doubling the mule's uh, maximum capacity, and in cases, uh, some cases tripling even. Even a fellow with a two-year music degree can do it. 
all right? Today, while I'm here and not at home taking care of my camels, my 14-year-old son will go out when he gets home from track practice. He'll take care of the camels. And that's not just slopping the hogs, throwing the feed out there. We've got an individual camel that's got arthritis, so he needs to be caught, haltered, led to a certain point, given a special ration of food and some glucosamine and chondroitin for his arthritis. Everything that you'd need to do with that camel, kneel him down, saddle, my 14-year-old son can do. Uh, just as kind of an adjunct to that, uh, part of my living I make in the winter as a tour guide in the Middle East. I, I do guided tours of Egypt and Jordan. And I know kids over there who are five, eight, ten years old who are told, go out and collect the camels. They go out, they bring them in, they kneel them down, saddle them up. This is not something that's crazy. Again, what everybody's heard about a camel, they're mean, they're recalcitrant, they'll bite, they'll kick, they'll spit. It's all wrong. It simply doesn't happen. They're incredibly smart, incredibly gentle, and the motivations that a horse has, all right, the way you get a horse to move forward is to make him think there's a predator behind him, okay? That's the psychology of working with a horse. It is that simple. Now, are there nuances and are there people who are very graceful and talented with it? Absolutely, but at the end of the day, the horse goes that way because he thinks there's a predator that way. It is that simple. Camels are the biggest thing where they live. They have no predators. So all of those motivations to get a horse to move forward where you mimic a predator don't work with a camel. You've got to have a whole different mindset. They react a lot more uh, positively to a positive reward, more like a dog, really, in the way they think. So here in the West, we will always draw the parallel between a horse and a camel. Even if you don't ask that question and verbalize it that way, we're all thinking that way because you grew up with a horse. Even if you didn't, your uncle had a farm, you rode one at summer camp, the guy walking down the street in Brooklyn, New York with a briefcase and a fine three-piece suit, if you ask him something about a horse, he knows something. He rode one on his uncle's farm, his dad had one, his grandpa did, he rode one at summer camp. But if you ask that same question about a camel, he'll look at you with this twisted look and he'll have no clue. So in the West, we're always gonna compare the horse to the camel and these questions are understandable and reasonable. How hard is it to break one? How hard is it to train one? It's incredibly simple. You're patient, you're gentle. They do have a great memory. If you're heavy handed, they'll file that away and they'll say, oh, Doug hit me that day. And you just Cadillac along thinking you know what's going great and seven years later, they just pull it out and go, Oh yeah, I remember that. So you're never ever heavy handed with a camel. They'll remember that. And how would they exact their revenge? Well, they bite you or kick you just like you imagine a horse might do. But they're incredibly gentle, incredibly social creatures. And I'm not trying to sell you a camel, okay? I'm just telling you that a monkey with a two year music degree can do this, all right? So one of the, the big myths about the camels is that the soldiers didn't understand them, couldn't handle them. And it, that again comes from that, that foundation of horses and mules. And again, if I can do it, if my son can do it. You know, the, the nomadic people of the world at one point didn't have a camel, and they had to adopt it. And they probably looked at all the animals in their realm. They looked at a lion, no, they eat people, that's no good. Giraffe, too tall, camel, let's do that. So if these cultures, and we can agree, already have a tough life, why in the world would they adopt an animal that's difficult and makes their life tougher? They, in fact, adopted the camel to make their lives easier. All right, so they're very gentle. Um, in a weekend, you can have one accepting a saddle and, and riding without bucking and jumping and acting like a fool. It really is simple. You want to buy a camel? <laughs> yes, sir. Wagon loads. Cody Mobley, any idea? It all depends on the size of the wagon. There you go. And, that, and that's not a smart elk answer either. Cody understands there are uh, different classes of wagons, different uh, wheelbase lengths, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Bob, you've got an idea on that? So we've got 2,000 pounds pulled by a team, okay? 2,000 pounds, you can kind of do the math there. If you've got a camel that singularly on his back could carry up to 1,000, let's say those bigger males, starting to look pretty good. And from an economic standpoint, you know what you're feeding that camel? That'd be nothing, because he's gonna eat mesquite, creosote, prickly pear, ocotillo, uh, everything that grows in West Texas. You're not carrying rations of food for him. Oh, and that water that he's carrying on his back? Yeah, he didn't get a drop of that. Only when they crossed a river or a creek did they water the camels. In the journals, they talk about going three days, five days, seven days, ten days without a drink of water. When they, uh, the camels, when, when they get to that point, they have, on the Eccles expedition, in fact, have abandoned 
two dozen mules, abandon them in what now is the, uh, the national park, abandon them, never be seen again, and every camel makes it back to Camp Stockton. Yes, ma'am. There were two groups of camels. Uh, the Beale Expedition of 57 had gone to California, stayed in California. Those two dozen were out there. In 1863, because nothing was happening with the camels in California, the federal government in DC sends message to California, we need to sell those camels. They get sold at auction. One fella buys them all. At the end of the war in 66, um, the remaining camels in Texas are sold at auction and a fella here buys them. And they become owned by two separate individuals and they're used for freighting. Uh, in California, those camels end up going into Nevada, packing salt for uh, refining uh, silver in the new silver mines of Nevada. In Texas, this fella Coopwood, who's a really, really interesting character, starts a freight line that runs from Laredo, Texas to Mexico City. So for three years, you've got uh, camel caravans running through central Mexico. Uh, he says he eventually gives up that job because of banditry in Mexico, and he brings his camels back up to Texas, headquarters them on South Congress, uh, just above the river, uh, Lady Bird Lake there in Austin, ends up selling them eight here, 10 there to traveling circuses. And that's really the ultimate disposition of those camels is those two private owners sell them in lots, just pockets here, five, eight, 10 here. And they end up exactly where you think they would be in America, in a traveling show or a zoo or something like that. Yes, sir. You can bet they did. There, there are good accounts of camels coming up missing from Camp Verde there in the hill country. And everybody reckons the Comanche, Comanche had come through. And in a word, what would they have thought when they saw this animal? Buffet. Yeah, you've got an animal that's going to be between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds. I'm, I'm reading the boy captives right now about the, uh, the two uh, brothers there in the hill country that were picked up. Came right through here, Fort Conscious, looked right through the troops. Bob Doug probably doesn't like to hear that story. But these guys, the Native Americans, were rounding up horses not just for trade uh, to Mexico or their own use, but for food. So you can bet if they were eating their own horses or horses gathered in raids, they see that 2,000 pound, eight foot tall you know, ham, basically, and uh, they're, they're seeing a meal, without a doubt. Yep. Bob, again, the Army never used them that way, but when Beale got to California at the end of, uh, well, fall of 57, from 57 to 63, when those camels were actually sold, he maintained control of that herd for six years, and he really fell in love with the camels. You saw the quote in there. He said, my only regret at present is that I have not double the number. Beale saw the value in the camels. He recognized it. So he ends up training a couple of camels to pull a wagon. That's how he gets around between Fort Tejon, his home there, uh, and Los Angeles, which would have been the nearest metropolitan center. Uh, stories about Beale speaking to uh, his camels in Arabic, giving them Arabic uh, commands to drive them was done. And he wasn't the first to do that. India has a huge carting culture with camels where they hook them up. Uh, interesting parallel story. At the same time the US Army had imported our camels, the Australian government did the same thing. All right, and It's a real quick trip from India on the Asian subcontinent there down to Australia. Today, descendants of those imported camels from 1830 to 1900 number around 300,000 feral camels. You think we've got a problem with feral hogs in Texas? Australia is like the textbook example of introduced species gone wrong, from their cane toad to dogs to the camel, and literally three, um, a third of a million feral camels in the outback. One of our own camels, in fact, our oldest, Irene, was brought over here in the late 80s, culled from those feral herds. The Australians, though, really took that carding culture to its pinnacle. They would have six, eight, 10, 12 camels hooked up in teams, pulling tonnage that would blow any old teamster's mind. Six, eight, 10, 12 camels pulling carts of cotton, uh, pipe uh, for um, uh, the, the, the roads in, the, in the, uh, the outback. Ultimately, they helped build their railroad, like with our camels, kind of put them out of work. By the 1950s, though, roads and rail had extended across Australia, and all those freighters were put out of business, and that gave rise to their feral camel population. And I think maybe there's a, a case where these two stories between Australia and the US kind of mix, and people hear about feral camels. It simply didn't happen here. If you look at the numbers of uh, horses and donkeys that were brought in by the Spanish, 
Spanish and it gave rise to our Western Burro and Mustang population. Tens of thousands of horses. The army imported 75 camels only. Not enough really to create a feral camel population. And again, we know where they were sold, where they ended up. But carting here, again, had the Civil War not intervened, we might have seen freighting operations with camels rise. All of this probably becomes negated also post-war because of rail, right? How many of you rode a horse to this talk today? You know, <laughs> maybe only Chris Morgan in the back, all right? When that old 1950s pickup truck dies. You know the mechanic of that thing, right, Chris? So those animals were put out of work post-war. Camels, oxen, all of those animals. So rail certainly would have done that. But the Civil War, again, was key. Yes, ma'am. You know what? They put it in their belly, just like you and I do. They're a, they're a mammal, all right? So when they drink water, it goes into their stomach. The hump on their back is filled with fat. And here's the great thing about being a camel. You don't get fat in any of those familiar places that some of us get it, all right? Uh, some of us more than others, perhaps. But camels only get it in their humps, all right? One hump, if it's an Arabian camel, the, the more common one, the one you rode in Turkey or the Holy Land, and in two humps if it's a Bactrian camel. That's the kind that lives in Mongolia. So, so if we can just for a minute believe that there's water in the humps, the, um, the obvious question comes, oh, so a, a two-hump camel can go longer without a drink. But it's not water, it's fat. And what you have to understand about that fat is that it has a, a, a huge role to play in thermoregulation for camels. It helps them maintain body temperature. That fat in their hump absorbs UV rays all day long, and it's storing up heat like a solar cell. Then at night, when the temperature drops in the desert, and you've got a cold night, that heat dissipates throughout their body. So then what does that tell us about the environment where a two-hump camel lives? It's a much colder environment. They need two solar cells on their backs. Now, camels do store water in a way, and they do it at the molecular level, but it's not anything we can see happening or, or kind of evidence in, in the process. But what they do when they drink water, their red blood corpuscles absorb it, okay? If you and I drink too much water, we can actually die of blood poisoning. Our red blood cells will actually pop, and you'll die of blood toxicity. A camel's red blood corpuscles are kind of oval, in shape, and they take on water at the molecular level and they expand, kind of like blowing up a balloon, out to its maximum size. And that's how they take that water on. So they do it in their blood, really, but it's not a great reservoir. There are Victorian journals that talk about a Saharan expedition and uh, we were going to die, so we cut into the camel's hump and drank water. It's simply impossible. If you can think of the fat on a pork chop or fajita meat, that's what's in their hump, and it's really the only place they get it. They get very little subcutaneous fat throughout their body, just in that, uh, that reserve there on their backs. So they do store water, but not in some kind of conventional way like we would think. Yes, sir. They'll live to be 35 or 40. Um, our oldest is 29, and she's still just as vibrant and, and full of life as you can imagine. Irene is her name. She's given us two babies over the years. She's the one who just became a grandma, in fact, about nine weeks ago. But 35 to 40 is reasonable. Now, that's under good management. They've not been overworked. You don't give them to Bob Bruni. Now, Bob will put, you know, 1,000 pounds on that camel every single day because he likes to show off. But if you keep a reasonable load on them, you don't work them too much, they don't get joint problems problems, 35 to 40. The oldest camel I've ever personally known was 42. She had been uh, still giving birth uh, well into her 30s. A friend of mine, in fact, the videographer of this film, uh, had that camel up in Missouri. What's the gestation? They, they carry for 13 months. Twins are incredibly rare, but in 22 years of working with camels, I've known of three cases of twins ever. The most recent was last week in Berlin at a zoo a Bactrian camel, the two-hump variety, and both camels, both babies are just kicking and alive as can be. Healthy, healthy. Yes, ma'am. That's the exact same question my father-in-law asked me. Okay? And understand that in the beginning, his daughter married a musician. Okay? So it's only getting better, right, Joe? Joe is my father-in-law's name. We, I make a living. Now, my wife's on faculty at Baylor, so it's okay if you're looking at me with that eyebrow kind of thing, wondering, what does this all mean? My wife's on faculty at Baylor. She brings home 
the benefits, all right, insurance, things like that. But I make a living with our family's camels, training, uh, um, taking them to uh, living history events like, like your own Christmas at Concho, those types of events all around uh, the U.S. I also guide camel treks out in West Texas. I've got two scheduled next week. Basically a trail ride, overnight camping with the camels. Now at Christmas, let me tell you what the guy with camels does, all right? Stop me if you've heard the story. Three noblemen from the east looking for a place, right? <laughs> yep. So from Thanksgiving weekend to Christmas Eve, basically, we do, last year we did 29 live nativities in 24 days. From Texarkana, Arkansas, to Fort Davis and everywhere in between. We're two places, three places a night sometimes. Okay, I want to know how you transport Just like a horse. The, the trailer is a little taller, of course. It's eight feet tall, but they walk in. It's, it's utterly boring to watch. Open the back door, they walk in, and they kneel down in transit because their, their center of gravity is so high. They've got those long legs. You know, when you're moving in the trailer like this, they could topple over easily. Uh, so they kneel down. Some of them know the minute they walk in, they just kneel down and assume the position. Now, interestingly, when the Army imported their camels, okay, they were on the USS Supply, you saw the image of that. When the USS Supply left the Mediterranean, when they crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, they hit rough seas, and for three weeks, the waves are like this. So that first shipment of camels, they've got 34 camels, each in its own little stall under the, the, the first deck. They're on this, what's called the spar deck in a stall. They have each camel kneel down, they hobble them in that kneeling position, and they put hay around them. And for three, I swear on my mother's grave, three weeks, those camels are knelt and hobbled, tied in that kneeling position. And when Porter, who's in charge of the USS Supply, says, okay, the seas have calmed down, they release the hobbles, every camel stood up, just chewing their cud, eating hay like it was another day at the office. Three weeks tied and hobbled. Yes, ma'am. This is a slow process, okay? <laughs> their teeth aren't even mature until they're 10 years old. So they get their final teeth in at age 10. Now the body and their muscles and their joints, really six, seven, eight years old max, they've hit it, all right? So this is one of the things that keeps uh, an American camel industry from really being created, right? You can go out and you can buy a horse, buy two, three, he's up and running, you can be roping. Cow, you're gonna get him up to a year, 800 pounds, send him to slaughter. If you're looking long-term in a camel operation, give me a call if you are, all right? You're looking at a long-term payoff of six, eight years. They're not even sexually mature for reproduction until four, but their bodies haven't hit their maximum size. I wouldn't even breed a female at four. I'd wait till she was six or seven so that I know that delivery would be safest for her and the calf. So it's a slow process for sure. All right, I think we've got probably time for one more and then Evelyn's gonna kick me out the door. Uh, yes, ma'am. Without a doubt, if you lined up 100 horses and 100 camels, you would have the same percentage of knuckleheads in the bunch, right? <laughs> two or three. It's why we have dog food, okay? <laughs> You're going to find two or three knuckleheads in the bunch. But across our eight, we've got a tremendous range of personality. Richard, who is truly our uh, kind of alpha camel in the bunch, he's the one who's just going to walk up to you and say, hi, would you scratch my stomach? He loves that. Um, Irene, our oldest at 29, she's been there, done it, seen it all. When she sees us walk from the barn, if we have nothing in our hands, she'll stand still. But if you walk out of the barn with a halter and lead rope like a bridle to go to work, she sees that and she just kind of goes like this. <laughs> and she'll walk to the back corner of the field. And then you've got all this range of personalities in between. They're incredibly gentle, just love them to pieces. They're family members. And I've always told folks, if business dried up tomorrow, nothing would change in my life. I'd walk out my back door, there are my camels. They don't have to make a living for me. I'm blessed that they do. Uh, and this has been a slow grow. Let me tell you, Bob Blueheart, Chris Morgan have known me 20 years. They, they knew when I was begging forts to let me come to, to bring the camels to their events. So this thing has been a slow grow, kind of like a camel, right? I mean, imagine you've got to go up to your father-in-law and say, you know, I'd kind of like to marry this girl, and I'm a musician. And a few years later you say, yeah, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna be a camel rancher. <laughs> you know, try being me. It's, it's not all the glamor that it looks like. All right, so we probably should wrap up here. Uh, Joyce, Evelyn, thank you so much. Bob, I appreciate you letting us use the space here. Um, thank you. 
Guys, I've got business cards up here on the table. If you're interested at all in what we do with our family's camels, or you just want to bring your grandkids to the farm to ride a camel sometime, you can grab one of our business cards. The farm's just outside of Waco. You're welcome there anytime.